evening. So I'll say welcome. Um, if I was at church, I would say welcome, 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 because that's what I do in triplicate. When I get excited, that's what I do. Um, but I will say I'm so excited to see you this evening. Welcome to Access Week 2023. My name is Dr. Tiffany Butler, Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Equity in the Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. I will preface this with uh, I am from South Jersey, so sometimes you may hear me get a little bit quick in my, <laughs> in my speaking, so just a heads up if that's a thing. Sorry, but I'm thankful for you uh, bearing with me. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And so Access Week uh, overall was created to be able to create a campus awareness of the need for an equity mindset to help all students thrive. And so our theme for this year, our umbrella theme, is uh, unlocking pathways to success. And so this year, as we thought about a sub-theme, it was more than words. What are the things that we could do to facilitate you being able to be in community with us, but also to be able to take things, learn things, but then be able to use them as soon as you leave out of here? How can we better connect you to opportunities and to people um, and facilitate conversations? Uh, so I think for the Alumni Mixer and McNair Research Symposium, it's hosted today uh, by DICE in partnership with Career Exploration Services and the Ronald E. McNair Post-Baccalaureate uh, Program. So joining us today is our esteemed colleague from Career Exploration Services, Ms. Ariel Smith, Assistant Director for Career Advocacy and Professional Inclusion. So Ariel, if you wanna just give a little wave, do a little wave, oh, there you see, okay. Say hi to her when you see her. If you wanna clap for her, you surely can. Uh, tonight we'll also hear from Ryan Webb, a recent alumna of Rutgers University, who will speak about her own professional self-discovery amidst her college experience during the pandemic and how she was able to persist and also thrive. Uh, again, uh, we'll continue on, we'll dive deeper into two micro workshops uh, on our own professional self-discovery and how to transform from a campus leader to a workplace boss. Uh, our intention is to provide a space for the connecting of people, and we aim to do this in the connection corner. So as we finish our micro workshops, we invite you to head down after our workshops to grab a bite, see our exceptional McNair scholars present their research and mingle, uh, connect with our exhibitors. And so if the exhibitors are here, as I call you, if you want to stand up and just give a wave so people know that you're here, um, from SHI International Corp, uh, Chelsea Suarez. Oh, there she is. Thanks. Yeah, we can give a clap, thanks. From Target, Jessica Wiggins. Oh, not here, oh, might be downstairs. Um, from UBS, Anna O'Keefe. From FDM Group, Betsy Montanez. Yeah. Thanks. Um, from, and finally, from City Year, Katie Lobst. Okay. Oh, and so as we head down into the connection corner, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for People Grove. And so People Grove is a mentoring software, I think a really intuitive, helpful software to connect mentors to mentees. So you can sign up to either get a mentor or to become a mentor. And as we finish up the evening, you'll have an opportunity for current students to get some giveaways. So we have some cool things from CES, but also some giveaways from DICE, maybe in the form of some gift cards. So if you can stay all the way till the end, you'll have an opportunity to be able to do that. I hope you won't miss it. So I encourage you to be intentional about your cross communication, your networking and building community amongst your colleagues and friends, uh, both today and as you continue in your professional journey. So on behalf of the entire DICE division, our Senior Vice President for Equity, Dr. Enobong, Anna Branch, and the Educational, group, Educational Equity Group, uh, welcome to Access Week 2023. So just a few housekeeping things. Um, this is our recording disclaimer. So uh, by attending the event, you're giving Rutgers the permission to record your image and grant Rutgers and, and all the rights to use the recordings in pursuit of the uh, university mission. So if you're struggling with that or have questions, please feel free to see one of our DICE staff members in the back. Additionally, we like to acknowledge the land on which we stand. So we acknowledge that the land on which we stand is the ancestral territory of the Lenape people. We pay respect to indigenous people throughout the Lenape diaspora, past, present, and future, and honor that those who have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. We also acknowledge that the Rutgers University, that Rutgers University uh, live like New Jersey, and the United States as a nation was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples. Also, we know 
that in order to be in community with us, you had to step away from other things. We know you might be coming from class, from work, from all over the place. And so we want to acknowledge that you're in community with us. So recognizing the current time, place, and space, um, we are in community naming and thinking about current events, social issues, the ongoing pandemic, distractions, upcoming deadlines, uh, things outside that, we may, that may be impacting us. Uh, and we thank you again for being in community with us today. All right, so here's what we're getting into tonight. So I'm gonna ask uh, in just a moment for Ms. Ariel Smith to come up and introduce our speaker. We'll hear from Ryan and then we'll move right into our workshops. Then we'll dismiss after a few um, housekeeping points and then we'll head downstairs into the connection corner for a bite to eat. We'll be able to connect, we'll be able to network and see the exhibitors uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to be able to do some giveaways and then we'll go ahead and dismiss. I do want to make you aware of just a couple of things before I invite Ms. Ariel up. Um, as far as restrooms, um, if you come out of the back exit, um, make a left, uh, I think it's two doors down, you'll find the restroom, and I think if you go three doors down, you'll also find access to the elevators. Um, if you're struggling to find those locations, there are signs, and if you don't see the signs, there are people that you can ask who have on dice apparel. Uh, also, because we're in the museum, we do have access to the exhibits, which means that as you're wandering around downstairs and interacting with people, particularly during the McNair Research Symposium, they're embedded within the art exhibit, which means you can't bring your food into those spaces. So just be mindful of that as you're eating and talking, that you put that down on the tables that are sitting there uh, as you communicate within, um, with the different presenters from the McNair program. Last thing, uh, oh no. Two things, sorry about that. Um, for your book bags. So right now, again, because we're in a library, there may be art around. And so as you're in this room, it's fine to have your book bag. But as you exit out of this room to go down to the connection corner, you can do, um, I would say, one thing. I'm not going to give you options, just one thing. We do have a coat room, which hopefully you put your coat when you came in. If not, that's okay. But we do have a coat room. If you're having a hard time finding it, head to the registration table, and they will direct you there. Drop your coat and your book bag. That way, you're kind of unencumbered as you head down to the connection corner. And the last thing, if you have questions throughout, and I imagine that there may be questions or folks may want to interact with our speakers, um, we have two microphones set up in the back. Please feel free to either raise your hand and someone will come help you. I think Brittany will come around and help you. Oh, you got their hand raised in the back? Yeah. <laughs> uh, or if you're able to, if you want to head back to the microphones, you can go ahead and speak. And so for the folks on the live stream, again, we thank you also for being with us. Uh, and I'll invite Ms. Ariel Smith to come do the intro for our speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Um, so I have the honor of introducing someone that I knew briefly as a current student and still know as now an alumna. Um, and her name is Ryan Webb. So I'm gonna read what Ryan sent me so that I can get it right because really Ryan deserves nothing less than perfection. And I told her I was gonna say that because it's true. So a recent alumna of Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations, Ryan Webb is now a people trainee at the iconic beverage company Anheuser-Busch in which she's, she supports various projects in the early career talent acquisition function. She's committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion and making an impact in her community. In college, Ryan was heavily involved in diversity-centered initiatives, joining the executive board of United Black Council, as well as serving on the CES, or Career Services, Black and Latinx Student Advisory Board. During her time at Rutgers, she identified inequities in the black and brown college experience. As a result, she spearheaded the creation of Rutgers' first black and Latinx new student orientation, connecting students to cultural, social, and academic resources, as well as the first Black and Latinx Career Symposium, a virtual networking event connecting students with multiple Fortune 500 companies dedicated to diversity. As she begins her career, she hopes to continue serving and creating lasting impact wherever she goes. And as you'll hear in her keynote, that is definitely work she is well underway with doing. So without further ado, Ryan Webb. Thank you, Ariel. Um, so 
Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to share my journey here at Rutgers. I can't express how great it feels to be back at my alma mater less than a year after I walked across the stage. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so once again, my name is Ryan Webb, and I am a 2022 graduate where I majored in human resource management in the minors and organizational leadership digital and digital communication information and media. So since my senior year, like Ariel said, I have had the pleasure of working with Career Services, service, serving on the Black and Latinx Advisory Council, and also to add the division of inclusion and community engagement to the list is very fulfilling, considering the connection it has to my profession as a HR um, professional. So with that, I will admit it was definitely a journey to get to be um, in a place to be in a position of service to my community and also be in contentment with my career early on. Um, and so in the, um, in the spirit of this year's Access Week theme, Unlocking Pathways to Success More Than Words, I will walk you through my journey of being a um, struggling underclassman, really falling into the cracks of learned helplessness and and to become a confident woman graduate and early professional. So I will walk you through my um, journey in which I largely contribute my growth to self-advocacy. And I'll touch a little bit more on learned helplessness and self-advocacy in, in, in a bit. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick rewind to 2018. So my college experience was bad. It was very, very rocky. Um, I, I'm sure all of you or many of you have some shared experience of a rocky road in your early collegiate experience. So I'm definitely no unicorn. Um, but for my, um, my journey, I originally planned on majoring in biology. So I was on the pre-med track and I had the pleasure of being accepted into the um, pre-med living and learning community. And so I was so excited to begin this next chapter of my life. Um, but the road was definitely not as smooth um, as I expected. Um, and quite frankly, um, it, it was a big, big shock. Um, so I went from being a 4.0 student, heavily involved in athletics and community service activities, um, to being a lost and insecure individual. And I would fail quiz after quiz and pass exams by the, skin of my, um, by the skin of my teeth. And I think what made me even more frustrated was that I was truly trying my best, um, but still I would consistently fail. And when I tell you that took a toll on my confidence it would be an understatement, especially in this early stage of my career when I was so bright eyed and had these plans everything was going downhill. So for me, my struggles academically really had a cyclical effect. So not only was I struggling academically, my social and cultural needs were being starved as well. Um, so at this point in time, I had no idea whatsoever that there was a um, community out there for me and resources out there for me um, that could support me in more ways than one. Um, and my mom likes to call it a tribe, if you would. I didn't have that, I was in my, my little box. And so to be completely transparent, um, during my first three years of college, um, they were filled with so much sadness, disappointment, and isolation. And by the end of freshman year, I would have fallen into the dreaded state called learned helplessness. I don't know if you all have heard of this term, but it's a psychological concept coined by psychologist Martin Sel Seligman that refers to the belief that one is powerless to change their circumstances, even if opportunities for change are presented. And this learned behavior can be the result of repeated negative experiences, in my case, repeated failures. Um, and they allows for a lack of control over situations in one's life. So a person who has learned helplessness may become passive and unmotivated, believing um, that their actions will have no effect on the bigger outcome. So now thinking back to my freshman year experience, this is a very mild example of how learned helplessness comes to be. 
So, but looking at learned helplessness through the lens of the communities that Access Week was created for, I think it's important to take into consideration the consistent inequities that we all face, um, especially within our generations, whether it's first generation, low income, or other underserved communities. Um, I don't think we recognize enough of the effect that um, historical events have on us, let alone institutional and systemic um, pressures that we experience every day. And I think at times it's almost expected of us to just you know, take the punches and accept our outcomes without putting, much up of, putting up much of a fight. Um, however, I think my minor struggles, I hope, will provide some sort of framework for you to really navigate um, any instances of learned helplessness, whether it's throughout your collegiate career or beyond. So, learned helplessness was a state um, I struggled with early on in my collegiate career, but it was self-advocacy that allowed me to step out of that um, and really take control and navigate challenges in my life in a more effective manner. So like I said before, the reason I am in this place of contentment in my life right now is because of the self-advocacy, um, self-advocating that I did throughout college. So self-advocacy is defined as the action of representing oneself or one's views or interests. And for me, self-advocating is speaking up for myself, for my needs and desires. And it's a concept that involves taking action um, in your life and seeking out resources and support. And it has allowed me to build confidence and self-esteem and a support system, build a support system. Um, and as something that develops over time, there are four particular phases uh, and accompanying skills that coincided with my journey of self-advocacy. So self-reflection, knowledge of rights, persistence, and action. So the first is self-reflection. So for me, this step is the most important as it helped me realize I was stuck in this um, stagnant state of health helplessness. And like I said, I really struggled during my freshman year academically and socially. And it wasn't until I hit my own version of rock bottom that I, and I was getting used to the, to failure no matter how disappointing it was. Um, but however, being able to really step back and look at where I was at in that moment and allow myself to identify and challenge the negative beliefs I had about myself and about the situation that I was in um, really allowed for me to reflect on myself, my beliefs and actions and create this sense of self-awareness to really blossom that I hadn't really had before. So upon reflecting, I was able to identify that I did have some control over my academic and social experiences. And that largely came down to me being able to recognize um, that I was being too humble to seek and receive help. Um, and that's something that in your early stages of your collegiate career, you need to be open to. Um, and that's something that I had not really done before, because like I said, I was succeeding in high school, um, so I didn't really need to seek help. Um, I was always on the move, but this was a new stage for me where I was struggling, okay? And so the second phase, knowledge acquisition. So my newfound self-awareness um, enabled me to take a closer look at my situation and identify the specific areas that needed improvement. So for me, those were academically, socially, and um, culturally. And in spite of my discomfort of seeking help, I saw academic assistance from the learning centers and utilized office hours, and as well as study sessions. And on the social side, I used Get Involved, browsing all of the organizations that had any relation um, or piqued any interest for me, whether it was cultural affiliations or beyond. And I now had a running list of resources that I could seek support from. And the third phase, persistence and assertiveness. So it wasn't enough that I had discovered these resources um, and these new social outlets to fix my problems. In fact, for me to get to the bottom of the issue, it really took assertiveness, 
assertiveness and persistence to, on my part, to not only locate the resources, but to actually use them. I think being in college, there are a lot of resources right in front of us. We're struggling, yet we still don't use them. Um, but it really takes that persistence to follow through with what you have um, for the resources that are there for you. Um, and my goal was to, my own goal was to improve my academic status and overall college experience. So it helped me to have a goal to look forward to and persist in my efforts. So college had already brought me a lot of lows and I knew I didn't want to experience that again. Um, so I would do anything to avoid that. And it was at this point that I realized I had moved my mindset from learn helplessness to learn optimism. Um, it's just another term coined by Seligman. Um, so when you change your explanatory style, you're in a much better position to not just survive life, but to flourish in it. And even if you were born to circumstances uh, that taught you learned helplessness or that have pushed you into learned helplessness and you don't even realize you're there, um, you can overcome it. And there's no matter what is happening in your life right now, um, in this very moment, you can overcome it. It just takes these steps to get through. So at this point in time, with those three, self-awareness and finding resources and support, and all the while staying assertive in my efforts, um, I was able to change my college experience a full 180. And so towards the start of my sophomore year, I was able to put myself out there by joining the United Black Council. So that is the umbrella organization of all African-American African and Afro-Caribbean um, student organizations on campus. And now that things were finally settling and I was um, in these social settings and working on my academic status and actually changing my major, because bio wasn't for me, um, I was now in a place where I was experiencing college for real. I was actually enjoying myself and learning and feeling myself grow. Um, and I was no longer in this learned helplessness state or continuous fight or flight state. Um, and I wanted to use this newfound exposure and resources to create a clearer pathway uh, for those that would end up in a similar predicament as I did, because again, I'm no unicorn. I know thousands of students are experiencing that same thing. Uh, so the fourth phase, action. So during my time with United Black Council, I saw it as an opportunity to really highlight the gaps and inequities um, that were present early on in my collegiate experience um, in order to improve the college experience for the community and really take action. In order to be successful in bringing light to um, these situations, uh, my communication skills were constantly in effect um, constantly in use and as the community outreach chair for the council, it allowed me to fully step into the role as a liaison between the student body and administration. And being able to bring up questions, concerns, and ideas, qualities consistent with self-advocacy, uh, this allowed for conversations with administration to happen that rarely didn't or rarely didn't get the push that it needed to. Um, so my actions, here are a few ways in which my, my actions, um, or how I took a result, or took action as a result of myself advocating. Um, so I, along with United Black Council, created the Green Book, and it's a resource manual to provide early access to resources, campus resources for students. Um, knowing that we typically have to search ourselves for resources and accidentally stumble upon them. So I want to make sure that there were um, resources early on in the collegiate experience. Um, next was creating a virtual black student social. So Rutgers, Black Rutgers, if you like to call it, already has a um, event called black, the Black Student Social, but this was during the pandemic where we were fully online. And I knew um, all the organizations were struggling, didn't really want to continue with programming because the world was in shambles. But I knew that this new generation coming in were going to feel the effects of not having community, but tenfold due to there being no physical access to resources and support. Um, so I want to make sure I created this um, 
event and access. And then also collaborating with the uh, IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, along with the Paul Robeson Cultural Center and Career Services to organize and host a virtual employer networking event for Rutgers Black and Latinx students. Um, recognizing that there was a lack of students from underserved communities within the larger Black Rucker, or larger um, Rutgers career fairs. So wanting to make sure that, again, creating access. And this is all because um, of the self-advocating I did early on and want to continue that um, for the generations after me. So all of these element, elements culminated in developing my leadership skills that allowed for me to better um, my own college experience and be able to impact um, my community as well. Um, and it also instilled a lot of confidence, which is a big byproduct of self-advocacy, um, at least for me. So I know we're talking about the workplace um, and we've looked at how learned helplessness can show up in the college experience. Um, and how self-advocacy can help mitigate some of those struggles. Um, but I do want to keep in mind the audience today, a lot of us, whether we're freshly graduated, still in school right now, we are, um, I think it's important to look through everything in the lens of the real world working setting. So learned helplessness is a very real occurrence in the working world as well. So whether you're on the job hunt or have secured a role, there are situations that can arise that um, individuals may feel that they don't have control over their life and or the ability to succeed. So leading them to develop this sense of learned helplessness again. So what could this look like in the real world setting? So this can look like job rejections, layoffs, micromanagement, constant criticism from managers. And so for a specific example, you're in a job search process and you have applied to dozens and dozens of ap job applications. And you keep getting rejection after rejection. So at some point, you're likely going to feel that your efforts are futile and that you have no power to change your situation. And you'll develop this idea about yourself that you're unable to even perform these jobs and that even though you have the experience, it's still not going to work out for you. And I think this leads to a lack of motivation, decreased confidence, et cetera. So knowing um, learned helplessness can show up in the workplace, how can we use self-advocacy to dispel the idea of learned helplessness in this um, setting? Well, the same framework um, is how, of how I navigated college, I hope can be useful here as well. So self-reflection, knowledge acquisition, assertiveness, and action. So there are several ways that you can avoid learned helplessness in the workplace in this specific situation. Um, so first, it's important to identify what your needs and wants are. So like I mentioned in the example, um, about previously having no luck applying for jobs, um, a great opportunity of reflection would be to look at where you think you're falling short in the process. So do you need to update your resume? Do you need to work on the STAR method, adjust your body language during the interview process? And from here, you can really pinpoint resources that can support you for growth and development. So such as resume reviews, actual mock interviews, and studying your resume so you get comfortable with the material. And next, know that what resources are there for you once you figure out um, what you need to work on. So, follow through and utilize what you have found, and of course, take action. So practice the STAR method relentlessly until you're comfortable speaking on your experiences and remain persistent in your job search um, because something will arise for you once you're persistent. Um, and by taking these steps to prevent learned helplessness in the workplace, you can really uh, create a positive experience when you feel um, where you feel empowered to take control of your career and succeed in whether efforts, whatever efforts you set forth. And um, we as humans go in and out of these states depending on where we are in life. Um, and although it varies from situation to situation, it could be very minute, it could be huge, um, it's a process and it takes time and lots of effort to move from learn helplessness to learn optimism and advocate for yourself. 
and I hope I have been able to provide some clarity um, for any of you that may be in a state of learned helplessness right now or may encounter it in the future. Thank you. <laughs> It's on. Oh, it is on. Um, all right. So at this point, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask Ryan, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, so I get to play Oprah for a hot minute. Oh, I got some smiles. Yeah, who doesn't dream of that, right? I get my own network, right? Get to work with Ava DuVernay, maybe direct a movie at some point. I don't know. Just throwing out ideas. Dice, want to give the money for that? Yeah, maybe? OK. Um, so um, Ryan, first and foremost, thank you so much. I don't know if you could hear me, but I was like over here snapping. Um, I was mm-hmm-ing. I was starting to worry about my job because you were talking so like accurately and wonderfully about like career services stuff. I was like, oh, that's right, HR. OK, it's cool. Um, but so we have three questions for you, Ryan. Um, do you want to give me the clicker or do you want to take the And we also have a poll everywhere that you all can hop into. We'll put it on the screen. Am I going backwards? I'm going backwards. Okay. So this is basically what we are hoping that you will get out of our talk. So if you go to Pull Everywhere or text Are You Careers to that number, I will load the poll. Share with us, how do you define self-advocacy? And while you're doing that, Ryan, can you remind us? I know you said it in your keynote, you talked about it a lot, but can you remind us how you define self-advocacy? Because we've got yes. some answers coming in already. So the confidence to ask questions even when it's quiet, speaking up for yourself, having a positive mindset. How does that resonate with what you were saying? Same, speaking up for myself, but also making sure I'm asserting my needs and wants. I think that's the biggest thing, asserting um, what's needed. We have similar things coming in, speaking up for yourself, self-care, being able to promote or stand up for yourself, so speaking to needs again. Thank you. You can keep it coming in if you would like. Our next question is, um, so I'm sure we all heard this when I was practicing the keynote with Ryan every time. I was like, ooh, you are so good at speaking to your strengths and skills with clarity and confidence. I work in career services and I still stumble over like when someone says, what are your top three strengths? Um, even though I ask you guys to do that all the time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is an essential skill to have though, being able to speak about your strengths, your skills with clarity and confidence. That is just foundational for engaging in effective self-advocacy. So Ryan, can you tell us how did you learn to communicate your strengths or skills with clarity and confidence? Sure, so this room is definitely different because I've never spoken in front of like an audience in an auditorium. Um, but I think my, college experience, being involved in organizations, I was constantly in um, some kind of situation where I was speaking, um, whether it was to administration or someone in a leadership position, so being able to get comfortable in those matrix environments, um, I think really boosted my confidence. And then also throughout the uh, um, job application process or um, Right before I graduated, when I was looking for full-time roles, I applied to everywhere, everything, um, and I was constantly interviewing. And I think the more I did that, the more comfortable I got. Um, and then I'm just speaking on my own experience. So when you're speaking on yourself, your truth, you can be confident. You don't have to um, 
you're not lying. So, <laughs> you know, you could be truly yourself. And I think that's for me, I'm just speaking on my experience. It's true. Like, authenticity breeds confidence Definitely. just naturally. Thank you. Definitely. This is the last question. What is one piece of advice you would like to share with the audience before we open the floor to questions? So the biggest thing would be to be open for change. I don't know if that's cliche, but going into college, I had this idea I was going to be a orthopedic surgeon. Um, I was going to live in DC. Like I had this vision, and once things took a left turn and my plan wasn't going right, freaking out. Um, but I think we're in this stage where, which is really cool that we get to explore different things, we get to mess up, um, and it's okay if things aren't going right, but being open to the possibilities, um, I think sets you up for success. Um, it kind of takes that pressure off of you um, in this early stage of life. I love that, like taking the pressure off of yourself because I think, and that speaks a little bit to, to something you were talking about in your keynote where we go in with so many expectations on our shoulders mm -hmm. um, and that can also feed into learned helplessness. So exactly. yeah, openness to change and yes. giving yourself the freedom to change things up. Thank you. So at this point, I'm gonna stop talking, you get to talk. If you have a question for Ryan, you can. I'm gonna activate something new on the poll everywhere. I promise I'm not texting my bestie, trying to <laughs> navigate text, uh, tech. Um, so if you have a question, you can text the same number or go to that same website, um, or you can raise your hand and go to one of the microphones in the back to ask your question. Oh, quick question. I don't know if it's a little personal, but I wanted to know after failing and getting your confidence low, how did you came back and decided to change your major and how do you break it to your family? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say luckily for me, um, I was the one that was putting a lot of pressure on myself to become a doctor. I know once I um, was speaking to them, I had a lot of support early on when I was struggling, I will say that. Um, and I think my family saw that I was struggling and wanted to um, help me find a new avenue for something that fit better for me. And I think this is another area where you advocate for yourself. Um, I don't think you should go into a profession if you're not truly happy with it, because um, you're going to be doing that for 40, 50, 60 years. Um, your family's not doing it, you are. So. I think advocating for yourself and maybe it helps to create a plan so maybe they can visualize um, your future. But again, being open to change. Um, my dad actually um, brought up the idea of human resources. He saw that it would fit my personality um, and I took the intro course and loved it. Um, so I'm glad I was open to that change instead of being like HR. What? No. Um, so yeah, just being open to change, advocating for yourself. Um, medicine's not for you. Whatever major is not for you, it's not for you. Um, there is another avenue there. So I think picking back off of that, um, being able to turn a direction, what resources would you access on campus that might help you be able to figure out the plan moving forward? Because I know as you come in and you have a plan and that probably maps to some classes that you have to take and if those classes are different, who, who do you seek out? How did you seek out help and assistance in that way? So career services, excuse me, career services. Um, I didn't seek it out until I absolutely needed it. And I really wish that I had went there early on in my college experience. I could have taken electives. Um, luckily, I stayed on track with um, my courses with pre-med somehow once I made that switch. But I really wish I would have gone to career services early on. 
um, and just have those conversations to know what was out there. Because I honestly didn't know HR was an option. Um, yeah, so just, again, being open to change um, and utilizing the resources that are, that are there. I think it's easier said than done. Um, I think a lot of students, we have a lot of, like, a lot of things at our feet, but we don't actually follow through and utilize them, even though we're paying for it. Um, so, yeah, maybe figuring out a way to, that could be an area of opportunity. Um, finding a better way for our, our resources here at Rutgers to connect with students or provide early access early on. Um, yeah. That ties into, so I answered one of the questions that came in through the poll everywhere. Um, Maybe on the academic side, could you speak to resources one more time that you used? I know you touched on it a little bit in your um, keynote, like how and where to find help academically when we're struggling with classes. And then from there, um, the discernment process around taking a semester off or leaving school altogether. So starting off with academic resources. Um, I forget what it's called. I don't know if it's the one-stop shop or they changed the name. It's the one-stop shop. Um, I, I did that. Um, there's actually an office in Bush. So I lived on Bush my freshman year. Um, and that's where I stopped in. It was very uncomfortable. It was in the corner of the student center. Um, and not a lot of people were there, but they were so helpful. Um, so I think just taking that step, they're there to help you. That's their job. Um, and I don't think I realized it until I actually stepped in, into that room that they were there. Um, and then the second, second part. Could you speak a little bit on the discernment process around considering whether you should take a semester off or leave school altogether, especially when in the cycle of learned helplessness and going through periods of repeated failure, academically yeah. especially? That's a great question. I think whenever I, the one time I considered taking a semester off was actually during COVID. Um, I think I realized that a lot more was going on in the world and that um, school is a big, a big focus for me, but in that moment, um, I guess doing things the right way um, isn't like the, the standard. You can switch things up. And I think as long as you have a plan and you know yourself, you know if you take that semester off that you're going to be able to continue um, going on after that, then um, I think that's, that's your decision. Um, but I think it's a great idea. I think I wish I would have done it um, during COVID just so I could experience college or the regular part of college, I guess, um, pre-COVID or after COVID. Um, or have as much normalcy as I could. Um, but again, life goes on. Um, but I don't think one semester is going to really throw you off course if you're um, persistent in your educational efforts. I have time for, I think, one more question. Um, and so, hmm. So I see the question about skills to translate from undergrad to professional role. That's our next workshop, so we're gonna touch on that. When I say we, I mean me and Hannah. <laughs> so Ryan, um, I'm going to give you, ooh. okay, I think I'm gonna try and combine two questions into one. Okay. Um, so there's one that wants to know about like, did you ever feel like you wasted your time? Or did you feel like you found your calling? And if so, how? That's me smushing together two questions. So it's like that's, that's a good two sides question. of a coin. Um, so in terms of wasting my time, I'm assuming it's with doing bio my freshman year. As Oprah, I give you freedom of interpretation. Okay, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm interpreting it as. Um, I don't think it was a waste of time at all. Um, luckily, I was able to stay on course, so I didn't have to stay in school an extra semester or anything. Um, I'm really happy that 
situation, that experience happened my freshman year, even though I know previous me would be like, what? Um, but I learned so much about myself. Um, learning what I like, learning how to move through things, push through hard things, um, again, was something that I hadn't done before. So I'm glad I experienced that early on in my college career, as opposed to uh, later on in life when I'm really in the real world, um, really adulting. Um, so I still had that cushion of, of college um, to make mistakes. So I don't think it was, I wouldn't take it back. Um, it wasn't a waste of time. It was, it was hard, but I, I learned a lot. So does that also speak to your process of finding your calling then? Yes, yeah. Because again, I never would have found HR. Um, and I think that's another thing why I made the transition from bio to HR is because um, I'm always scared of being stagnant, of being stuck, um, being stuck in a box. And um, I was not passionate enough for the medical field. And you really need to be passionate in that field, in that space. Um, in HR, on the other hand, there's so many different areas. So whether it's data analytics, um, compensation, working with numbers, um, employee engagement, you can go into employment law. Like there's so many different aspects within it that I knew I would be able to find an area for me that I would truly be happy working um, until retirement. So. That's right. There's the career journey, and then there's the retirement journey. Exactly. That's the journey that I am <laughs> counting down towards, but also not too quickly, because I like my career journey right now. Um, thank you so much, Ryan, again. So now... I would like to welcome up my colleague from Career Services. Oh, sorry. If you would like, you can take out your phone and scan the QR code to give us some feedback on the keynote and the Q&A session. And my colleague, Hannah, is going to join me up here for a very quick workshop on transferable skills. So from being campus leaders right now, just like Ryan was a year ago, to workplace bosses, just like Ryan is right now, um, these are some transferable skills that you can gain vocabulary around to articulate um, and communicate your professional value to people in various settings. So Hannah, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself really quickly. All right, hi everyone. I'm Hannah Valenzuela. I'm a graduate coordinator for Career Exploration and Success, and I'm currently a first year graduate student studying city and regional planning. So there are three things that we hope you get out of our time today. We're gonna to go kind of fast so that we don't keep you from the expo downstairs and the food. That's the fun part, um, the tasty fun part. So first, we hope that you'll be able to think critically about your experiences in and outside of the classroom that are setting you up for success in achieving your post-graduation goals, just like Ryan did for us tonight. We hope that you develop language to communicate experiences effectively and meaningfully to people who can help you achieve your post-grad goals. And then finally, and possibly most important, we hope that you're going to be able to identify where and when to use this language so the right people see the right language at the right times in the right places. Three parts, very straightforward. We're gonna tell you about these NACE competencies. We'll even tell you what NACE is. Then we will go into actions and results, which are a key way of framing your skills and strengths, especially in written professional documents like your cover letter and resume. And then we'll end things up with pro tips and another QR code to give us some feedback. So part one, thinking critically about your experiences in post-graduation success, how they work together. Um, it's all about pursuing your goals. This is the framework that we use here at Career Services to explore and think about your career journey. And tonight we're focusing on the pursue your goals section. 
NACE, or the National Association of Colleges and Employers, provides language around the core, like key skills and like or competencies that they expect college educated entry level talent to bring with them into the workplace. Hannah, wanna tell us a little bit more about NACE? Yeah, so they want college educated individuals like you to be career ready. They have eight core competencies that, um, that help you understand what employers want in an employee so you can be successful in the workplace. So we're gonna share those eight core competencies, those core skills now. Yeah, so the first one is career and self-development. An example is develop long-term goals. The second is communication. And an example is respect diverse communication styles. The third is critical thinking. Um, example is make decisions using sound, inclusive reasoning and judgment. And lastly, equity and inclusion. An example is solicit and use feedback from multiple perspectives. So when you're looking here and you're thinking back to Ryan's keynote, you even heard Ryan use some of this language in her keynote. She spoke about communication. She spoke about it definitely spoke on the topics of equity and inclusion, trying to make Rutgers more accessible and therefore a more equitable and inclusive place to black and brown students. Um, she definitely engaged in a lot of critical and reflexive thinking. Um, we would love for you to take a moment and talk to the people around you. How have you implemented or used these skills during your time here at Rutgers? Take like 30 seconds, talk, don't be quiet. Use your normal voices. All right, so we have someone very brave, willing to share one of the competencies, the core skills that they have developed, and um, they're gonna take the mic now. Um, hi, my name's Colleen. Um, I go by she, her. Um, one of the competencies I said was career and self-development. Um, I was looking back on basically like this past year already, and I feel like I've put myself a lot out there career-wise as a freshman, which I'm really proud of myself for, and also developing myself um, a lot as a freshman as well, so. Yes. Thank you for the snaps. The next four, the final four, are so leadership, serving as a role model, professionalism, that can be a loaded term. So let's look at the words on the screen. It really comes down to like key actions that you are choosing to take, being present and prepared, following through on your word, and then meeting and exceeding goals and expectations, which means you need clarity of expectations. That's professionalism. That's what you can ground yourself in. Teamwork, listening carefully to others. And technology, so being open to learning new things like how to manage a poll everywhere on your phone and a clicker in your hand and a mic in the other hand and knowing that you're too old for TikTok. That's technology. <laughs> <laughs> so again, take a couple seconds, turn and talk with a neighbor. How do you see yourself developing these skills, utilizing these skills, these strengths in your everyday experience here at Rutgers? And I will bring you the mic. So thank you to Colleen for being the first person. Or, or Dina will bring you the mic. Do you like first row? No big deal. 
Fox Show de Jerome. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? what? All right, and so now we have someone else with the mic ready to talk about one of these competencies, these skills. Um, hi, my name is Kanisha. Um, my pronouns are she, her, her. I'm a McNair scholar. I have to shout them out. <laughs> um, the competency I would say I work on would be technology. In my functional genomics class, the whole class is based on learning different technologies for genome sequencing. I promise I'm not 100% lost. But I make an effort to at least be, like, try to learn new technologies. I always go after class to kind of learn everything. And I guess a little teamwork is mixed into it because we work in groups with people. I hear professionalism as well. Again, being present and being prepared. Like, being present. Being willing to learn and show up as your best. Because that's all you can be. All right. So, if you want, you can also share on the poll everywhere, no pressure. I think you guys know the number by now and the website. It doesn't change, you know, we've got a limited funded account. <laughs> that was live stream, sorry CES. Anyway, so now it's time to focus on like using this terminology, using this framework to communicate your experiences purposefully to achieve your postgrad goals. And that's all about really focusing on the concrete actions that you're taking and the results that they get. So let's go back to our, our favorite semi-loaded example of professionalism. The concrete actions that you can take to exhibit this competency, this skill, this strength of professionalism, again, are in these examples here. So, you don't just say, I was professional, or if you're talking on a resume, um, maybe sometimes I'll see a bullet point that might say something like, um, received an award for being professional. And usually the feedback that I'll give to someone is, well, what does that mean? Tell me more. And then I get this really wonderful insight. Like, I didn't just show up on time, I showed up early. I wasn't a manager, but I still, taught, like onboarded the three new people that came on two months after me. Um, I communicated clearly the expectations. I made sure we were following safety protocols. And then I'm like, that, that's professionalism. Ensuring that proper procedures are followed at work, communicating with respect and clarity consistently, de-escalating conflict, showing up on time, showing up early, again, exceeding expectations, demanding clarity of expectations, that's all professionalism. So those are the actions that you're taking, asking for clarity of expectations, showing up early, communicating, um, ensuring the safety, proper procedure, safety procedures are being followed. Those are the concrete actions you're taking. The result, you are contributing to the successful daily operations of your workplace. You're improving or strengthening or supporting safety and well-being in your workplace. So that's the result. And that's how you want to be able to talk about your skills, your strengths, on your resume, in your cover letter, face to face. And just like what Ryan said in her keynote, the more you practice it, the better you get. So you can just make up a student like I just did, and it kind of just starts to come out very naturally. Because it's, like Ryan said, you're already doing it. It's already there in your life. You're not making anything up. So the confidence is already inside of you. You just got to practice with the words. And you just got to remember, wait, but what am I really doing? How can I explain it as concretely as possible? And what impact is that having? How am I changing lives by doing this? You might not think that like your part-time job as like a grocery store person in high school changed lives, but people need to eat. And also like a friendly checkout person at the grocery store can make your day and a not friendly one can kind of break it. Like, speaking from personal experience from a couple days ago. So you really, you really are having an impact no matter where you are. So that's the key to really speaking with confidence and clarity about your skills and strengths. We have some examples. I will talk to Dr. Butler about getting this PowerPoint out there. You can also have an advising point with me or Hannah if you ever wanna go over these examples together because I don't wanna keep you from the other parts of tonight. So we're just gonna go right to the pro tips at the end. 
Hannah, I'm going to give you the pro tips because I just talked a lot. Yeah, just use the language that you've learned today within your resume, within your cover letter, in interviews, um, just even talking with people when you're networking at your, for your elevator pitch. And then if you have any questions or want to do like a mock interview to come to CES, and we're more than happy to help you. We have time for probably one question. If you want to use the poll everywhere, I'm getting more comfortable with the skill of technology and looking at my phone to answer the questions, or you can raise a hand. Um, and if not, we would love to hear your feedback on this workshop as well. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to go for it. So thinking about utilizing skills right now, as we exit out of here, what are ways in which we can maybe practice some of the skill sets that you mentioned today? What does that look like? Maybe even downstairs in the connection corner. I practice today. Yeah, I think just just starting fresh, I think, is the biggest thing, learning how to talk about yourself and knowing the different power verbs. Um, I think everyone needs to start somewhere, so just getting out and having a bunch of different conversations, knowing what works, what doesn't work, and moving forward from there. It's just all about experience. To build off of that, I would say, since you've already been taking pictures with the QR code, if you want to take a picture of this screen, and then I'll jump to the next screen with the other four competencies, take a picture so you have it now, and then think on your way down to the next section of tonight, well, what are my top three of these competencies? Which I think I made a joke about your top three earlier and how I, I struggle with it. Um, what are your top three? And so when you go down, especially to the connection corner, be ready to share that with the alumni who are in the connection corner and even with your peers who are in your connection corner that maybe you haven't developed a close bond with yet. Um, and you know, you can kind of look at it from the perspective of, um, I did this with someone in the room earlier tonight, I'm really into astrology, I can say my top three, sun, rising, and moon very quickly, and I feel like it just gives a wonderful insight into everything about me. So like really embrace it and hold on to it like that. Like this is me, you can own it. I just learned these, this terminology like five minutes ago, but I heard this and I was like, oh yeah, that's me. I am a Pisces sun and my birthday is on Friday, just saying. Um, like, so you can say, yeah, I do have excellent communication skills. I am a great critical thinker because of my genetics classes and how they're making me think, not just about how we work, but also about how people in power talk about how we work. So take a picture. And take a picture. And then on your way down, just figure out what your top three are. And it can change tomorrow. Be open to change. Yeah. Last question. I guess I'll talk loud enough. Uh, oh. so, sorry. so sorry. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is, sometimes we could have strong competencies, such as leadership, professional, and teamwork. Um, and then we'll have weaker uh, competencies such as technology, equity and inclusion, uh, and I'm drawing a blank right now, uh, communication, for example. Um, what would be some of your recommendations to, to kind of work on improving those weaker competencies and feel like they're not so necessarily forced? Like, I want to be more inclusive in, in my conversations and in, in my everyday um, conversations and, and whatever I'm doing, essentially. Um, but sometimes it might feel forced. What are some of your recommendations to really work on those competencies that you might not necessarily be strong in, and you want to still be able to have an effective conversation and be effective in the workplace? Okay. Um, so 
my first my first thought is I like to be strengths and solutions oriented, so play to your strengths, which is again why it's really great to know your top three. Um, and I can even bring it back to astrology. I think sometimes people like to point to a sign and be like, oh, they're the emotional vampires of the zodiac, Scorpios. No, don't do that to them. They just feel things very deeply, but we all need deep feelers in our lives, right? So play to your strengths. Try and have a strengths mindset. Try and be solutions oriented. So if you are aware that perhaps, if someone's aware that perhaps um, equity inclusion, um, the action of soliciting and using feedback from multiple perspectives is a challenge right now. Again, because change happens. So it's a challenge right now. Maybe because of social anxiety or maybe because you're still developing a sense of cultural competency or awareness. You're not sure how to put that into action yet. Then think about what your other strengths are. And again, you might be really strong at critical thinking or you could have a strength in teamwork and lean into that and allow that to fill in for right now the areas that you feel like aren't your strengths. Again, knowing that everyone changes and grows over time. And if you want to get stronger at it, well then persistence, right? Like, so do it, go out, get that knowledge and figure out what you can do to get stronger. Um, but have a strengths mindset and give yourself grace because um, no one is perfect, um, but you can be excellent. Yeah. I think that's it. Dr. Butler, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, you tell us, let me get the mic right. Um, so let me head on down through the slide deck here. All right, so I think before we dismiss, I know we have, I know the staff are heading down to kind of prep and prepare, but I'm gonna take the mic and do something a little bit, um, I'm gonna call it extra from back when I used to teach in biomedical engineering. So I know we learned a lot of skill sets today and I really appreciated the energy and the buzz in the room when folks were moving to talk to one another. And so I'd like for you to be able to do that again. And I think the pieces that you were talking about, about playing to your strengths, we do have a few minutes left, so let's maybe practice that for just a moment. So if you could turn to your neighbor and just share three strengths that you can, you can think about for yourself. And then I'd like to maybe hear you articulate that out loud so we can give each other some claps before we head down and speak with the vendors and with one another. We've already got those things in queue and we can pull them out, you know, with a beverage and a, and a snack. So again, take maybe one minute, go ahead, talk to your neighbor and just share, what are your three strengths? And they could be from NACE, they could just be generally three strengths that you have. So please go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I did. Did I not find the slides? Okay, great. All right, so I'm hopeful at least your one partner has shared. If you haven't, if the other partner hasn't already shared, make sure that they have some time. So this is like your one minute warning.
All right, 30 second warning, and please be ready to report out. All right, I see a lot of hands moving, but I think people are calming down just a little bit. So do we have a volunteer or two to be able to share the strengths that they've identified about themselves or their neighbor? Oh, I see one there, yeah. Oh, I see two over there, wonderful. Hello, my name's Erica, I go by she, her pronouns. Um, I think one of my strongest skills is communication, mm -hmm. especially in jobs I've held um, in different fields, so like I've had clients where I worked retail and I work um, with babies in education, so I feel like with those experiences I've gained skills to not just communicate but communicate effectively mm -hmm. and be able to build rapport with clients and that trust. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Give some snaps. I think you mentioned something really. Oh, just, you mentioned something really interesting about where you learn those skills, and I think that's really important, especially as young professionals um, growing in their professional career. Speaking to the areas in your life of which you have experience, whether it's retail, whether it's babysitting, if you if you're the oldest of seven children, you have project management experience, right? You can manage a team. You can probably like, resolve conflict amongst teams. Um, those are real things, and so I appreciate you for sharing. Thanks. Please. I was just going to say to like add on to that communication, I feel like um, one of my strong suits are equity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And like with that comes clear communication of trying to use more gender inclusive terms or terms that are culturally sensitive, not using anything that's derogatory. I think that's very important in making a space for that's comfortable for everyone to speak in. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm Sara Postdoc here at Ruggers. So I work with this big, huge research team. Um, and I think, like, communication is something that it's really helping. Like, the way in which you also work with, like, people in so many different, um, like, fields from engineering to disaster science. It's so important to find, like, a way to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also very important, like, the equity and inclusion because I have to be consciousness of, like, the background of everybody and kind of, like, make sure that I don't take for granted what I know, um, like, as something that everybody might know. And like myself, I have to find my space like as an international student, as a woman in security. Mm -hmm. And so now I try to apply what I learned when I was struggling with that in making like more like open the discussion or anything when someone might be feeling the same way. And then of course team working, cause you know, like I like work and maybe, you know, have to also combine a little bit of leadership. So I think it's important to keep in mind that you are a leader, not a boss. Mm. So mm -hmm. like if you mm -hmm. are an example and not just someone dictating what you gotta mm. do, mm. that works much better mm. and it's, so that's my experience. <laughs> mm, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. And again, it's another communicate with your neighbor. I, I just love those. I love it, sorry. Um, what I'd like for you to do is to think about one area of growth that you'd like to work on. And as you communicate with your neighbor, turn it into a strength. So you're gonna get one, maybe two minutes. Think by yourself for maybe 30 seconds about one area of growth you'd like to work on. And as you turn and talk to your neighbor, turn it into a strength. Communicate it as a strength. Does that make sense? You have a question about that? You understand what I'm asking you to do? Oh, I see head shakes. Can I get a thumbs up if you really get it? Phenomenal. All right, I'll give you 30 seconds. Go ahead. Are you trying? We got time. We, got, we have time.
All right, this is your 30 second warning. And I'd like for a few people to report out when we finish. So again, 30 second warning, finish up your conversations and then we'll go ahead and share out. Oh, I feel the hush come across the crowd. I see the hand stopping with all the things. That's wonderful. Is there a brave somebody who will share? Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Larissa DePaula. Um, I'm a Bossy Scholar from Boston. Um, Shout out Bossy, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, something that I was discussing with my neighbor about was self-development. I think it's something that's always a work in process. Um, especially being a freshman, I think there's a lot that I need to like know more about myself. But I definitely don't think it's a negative um, thing to be working on, just because I feel like your entire life you will always be working on yourself. Yes, yes. Thank you. Do we have one or two more people who'd like to share? Okay. Hi, it's Kanisha again. Hi, um, well, I was talking with my neighbor about soliciting and using feedback from multiple perspectives. Um, I know myself, I'm a very hard-headed person. It's very hard for me to take feedback or constructive criticism. Um, and unfortunately, in my field, I will be receiving a lot of that. So I know that's something that I need to work on. And to do that, I try to put myself out there more. And I will personally try to ask people for their opinions. Like, oh, what do you think? Or how does this come out? Just to kind of hear their feedback and kind of get used to it. But I know that's something that um, until I learn to kind of get over that hump that people are trying to help me, they're not trying to break me down. They're just trying to help build myself up. Um, so that's something that I know I just need to kind of work on, receiving feedback, and then any critiques, learning to incorporate that in my work and see it as just a learning experience from that point on. Yeah, thank you for sharing, thank you. Is there one more, did I see one more person? Are we? All right, well thank you for indulging me in that exercise. I appreciate hearing your voices in the room. So we're gonna continue on, because I know, I know I'm getting hungry, I feel the rumbles, so I'm, I'm going to, yeah, yeah, right? It's that time. All right, so a couple of things before I dismiss you to the connection corner. Um, so as we go downstairs, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, please go ahead to the lobby. And if you have a book bag, please make sure that you drop it there. As you head downstairs, the exhibitors will be at the base of the stairwell for you to be able to connect with um, who you saw kind of give a wave early uh, in the talk. Um, also, uh, if you need to use the restroom, there are restrooms located just outside of this door. If you go, I think, two doors down, you'll find a restroom on the first floor, uh, and three doors down, you'll find the elevator. Uh, if you're still struggling to find it, if you take the elevator, go all the way down, you'll still be able to find another restroom downstairs, too. So that's okay. We won't, we won't have you in here struggling. Um, beyond that, um, the McNair Research Symposium is happening um, down in the, the lower dodge or the further into the connection corner, and there are art exhibits there. So please make sure that you're not taking food, even though we're hungry and tummies are rumbling, make sure you're not taking food into the art exhibit space. They've allowed for us to have space to be able to walk and roam and see the exhibits, and we're here alone to wander. Well, I won't say wander as we please, but to wander respectfully around uh, the space. So um, let's make sure that we're doing that. Are there any last minute questions before I dismiss you to exit? I like to give seven awkward seconds to be able to. Phenomenal, okay. All right, well, thank you so much for your time and attention. Let's give another hand clap for CES and for Ryan for coming and giving us a real word about uh, transferable skills and self-discovery. Thanks so much. We'll see you downstairs.